Hello, and welcome to Ceramic Storytime with Sue. I will just give you a moment or two to join me here live. Um, oh, <laughs> put my head above the title on the screen. Um, so let me just check to see if I am live. Um, today, we're going to be reading um, my blog post, 15 Tips to Get Started with Glaze Testing. So, um, if you, oh, there I am. Okay, so I can see that I'm live. Um, so, if you're here with me live, please set, say hello in the comments. Um, and as I go through and read, the blog post that I'm going to read, feel free to ask questions in the comments and then I will answer them as I go along. So thank you for joining me. Um, if you've been following along uh, with my week, um, I had to reschedule this story time. Uh, it was originally scheduled for Thursday, but we had this crazy windstorm on Wednesday night. Um, that uh, a tree branch snapped the power line to our house, which caused a surge of electricity to um, fry some power bars in my house. And there was a small fire in the middle of the night. And then we didn't have power for like 30 hours. And so, um, so all is well. Everything's fine. No big damage. Nobody got hurt. So all is good. Um, so here I am on Sunday doing story time. So hopefully some of you who can't join me on a weekday uh, were able to join me today. Um, so again, I'm going to read my blog post called 15 Tips to Get Started with Glaze Testing. And if you want to read along, you can go um, to the link that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen, bit.ly forward slash glaze testing tips. Um, and then that will take you to this blog post um, and then you can follow along with me. Um, so that's bit.ly forward slash glaze testing tips, all one word. Um, so that'll get you to the article and you can also um, download it as a PDF um, if you, if you want to save it to your files. Um, hello, Susan is here, and Lynn, hi Lynn, and Deb, thank you all for the kind words. Um, okay, so yes, feel free to comment, ask questions as I go, and I'm going to um, share my screen here, and remove that, and here we go. So 15 tips to get started with glaze testing. Um, and then if you wanna download it, um, there's a link here that you can click and you just enter your email address and then it'll send you a PDF of this um, article. Um, hello, Joan and Onita. So glad to have you join here. Okay, lots of people are coming. Um, Facebook is a bit weird sometimes when I'm doing a live video where I can't actually see, I can only see like the most recent comments. Um, so hopefully I don't miss your comment, but if I do, uh, feel free to post it again. So my introduction to glaze testing. I find ceramic glazes to be absolutely fascinating. I had no idea when I started working with clay that glazes would become the main focus of my life. My first year of pottery school was mainly about learning how clay worked and different ways of making different shapes. The focus was on form, function, and skill building, not so much on color and aesthetics just yet. Glazing was always an afterthought, and I basically ruined most of my pieces by glazing them. In the first year, we didn't make our own glazes, we just used the studio glazes that were provided. I didn't have a clue what glazes were made of, how they were made, or what happened to them in the kiln. And to be honest, I wasn't all that interested. I just wanted to finally make something that looked how I imagined it should. I was trying to be an artist. Somehow, I ended up in art school, which is the last place that I would have imagined myself a few years prior. But life is funny like that. Then came first semester of my second year my very first glaze technology class. 
This was a major turning point in my life. We finally learned to make glazes ourselves. We made a lot of glazes ourselves. Collectively, as a group, we made close to 1,500 glaze tests. And this is when I really fell in love with ceramics. First of all, wearing a respirator and weighing out powders using a triple beam balance scale made me feel super cool like a scientist. Yeah, I think scientists are cool. The systematic testing that we did gave the right side of my brain a little break and lit up the left side of my brain that loves systems and calculations and data. Math and chemistry were my best subjects in high school, and even though I didn't understand the chemistry of glazes yet, I felt like I was being taken back to my roots. Glaze testing felt really natural, and I finally understood why someone like me ended up in art school. That semester blew my mind. As a class, we first tested 128 different base recipes with multiple variations of each. Then we each chose two base recipes and we did color runs with 45 different colorant tests for each base recipe. So this is a picture of one base recipe with 45 different colorants um, and opacifiers. So we've got like uh, titanium, Rutile, Zircopax uh, are all in the front and then our main colorants are at the back. Then we each chose nine colorant tests that we liked from each base and made these glaze triangles where we blended each glaze one-to-one -one with every other glaze, resulting in 45 more glaze colors per base. So basically we took nine different colors and we did half and half mixes of each color with every other color, which gave us 45 different like blended colorants. Um, so there's a lot of different, when you start mixing colorants, there are so many variations that you can get. We had a lot of glaze cups and a lot of test tiles. After taking that class, I was hooked on glaze testing. I loved trying new recipes and adding and removing ingredients to see what would happen. I would do lots of mini color runs, testing just a few colorants with a base recipe to see how they reacted and whether I wanted to explore further. I took lots of notes and photographs and spent countless hours staring at test tiles and recipes and coming up with new things that I wanted to try. I got to the point where I was more excited about test tiles coming out of the kiln than my own pottery. I made pots just to put glazes on them. And now, 10 years later, with thousands of tests behind me, I'm still just as curious and excited about glazes as ever. Uh, just gonna check the comments. Hello from Dublin, Allison. Hi, Kathy and Christine. Thank you for joining me. Okay. The number one habit that will deepen your understanding of glazes. After leaving school and putting together my home studio, I no longer have the luxury of glaze firings happening every few days. My glaze firings were often several weeks apart since I was making pots part-time and I was the only person filling the kiln. Since my glaze firings weren't very often, I made it a habit to put at least one test into every single glaze firing. I didn't want a glaze firing to go by without getting new information. I needed to seize each and every opportunity to try something new and see the results. Seeing results are the only way to learn and move forward. This one little habit multiplied by years of glaze firings had led, has led to a much deeper understanding of how glaze materials work. So my number one habit that you can adopt as well is to put a test into every glaze firing. We potters are so like are so lucky that we can create our own glazes from scratch and have an infinite number of surface possibilities to choose from. The only thing that gets in our way is a lack of understanding of how our materials work and how to solve the problems that arise. Developing a regular glaze testing habit is going to bring you closer to that deeper level of understanding with every firing. I would love it if my story inspires you to make glaze testing a habit in your studio as well. I have some tips and ideas for you to get started down the glaze testing rabbit hole. Uh, just back to the comments. Hello, Sharon from Alabama. 
uh, Dajana from Croatia and Carol. Um, welcome, everyone. So 15 tips to get started with glaze testing. If you're like me and are fascinated by how glazes work, or you just want to understand glazes better so you can create unique surfaces for your pottery, here are some tips that will help you deepen your relationship with glazes and expand your palette. Number one, make lots of test tiles. Make so many test tiles that you don't think twice about using them. Test tiles can be any shape or size that you wish. They can be extruded, rolled as a slab, squished, thrown on the wheel, smooth, textured, you name it. It doesn't matter how you make them, it just matters that you have them available and that you use them. So here's a picture of my boxes of test tiles um, that I've done over the years. So these are just some of the test tiles that I have. I have boxes and boxes of organized test tiles. Um, and next week, uh, just a little um, heads up, I'm going to be reading a post about uh, different types of test tiles that you can make. So if you're curious about um, ways you can make test tiles and different test tiles you can make, then um, stick with me here and we'll look for the next story time. So number two, make test tiles of every clay body that you use regularly. Glazes will appear different and react differently to different clay bodies. When you're testing a glaze, test it on multiple clay bodies if you can. So here's an example um, of testing gla glazes on three different clay bodies. So these are Plainsman clay. Um, this is the Plainsman M340, the M390, and um, this could be the M370 or the P300. I can't remember. I think this is the M370. So if you use multiple clay bodies in your work, then make sure that you're making test tiles out of each clay body that you use. Number three, make test pots. Test tiles tend to be small and only give a certain amount of information. It can be disappointing to find a glaze that you like on a test tile and then glaze a whole piece with it and it looks completely different. I recommend making a bunch of test pots so you can see how glazes pool and run down vertical surfaces, etc. To make test pots, choose a method that's really fast so you can make lots and you're not worried about wasting them. Make little bowls or cups or extruded cylinders. Test pots are great for filling in the spaces between other pots in your glaze firings. Um, so these are these little um, slab built bowls that I like to make and I just love um, glaze testing. So it shows me how the glaze pools. Um, I can make a lot of these in a very short amount of time. Um, so that's the key is that you just have so many that you're not like, ooh, do I wanna waste a test pot on this glaze? Um, if you have so many of them, then you won't hesitate to just throw a test into the kiln. Uh, number four, buy some glaze testing cups with lids. You can buy a sleeve of plastic drink cups, or I like to use small clear plastic deli containers. They have flat lids so they can be easily stacked and stored. Um, so in this photo, we've got these drinking cups with lids um, on the left here, and then we've got these deli containers on the right. Um, so they're good for different reasons. Um, these are more narrow, so if you're making a very small batch, um, having a narrow cup is going to help you um, have like the volume to dip a test tile, um, where these are a bit wider, and so you wouldn't have um, as deep of a glaze to dip your test tile in, but then these can be stacked and these can't. And these lids, um, you can only like put them on and remove them so many times before they start cracking. So um, I do prefer these, but I, uh, I'd i like to find a smaller, like a, a narrower version of these types of test cups. Um, okay, number five, test your current glazes at different thicknesses. A good way to get started glaze testing is to take the glazes that you're already using and try one second, three second, six second, and 10 second dips, each on a separate test tile. Label them accordingly and fire them. You may get some interesting results with different thicknesses depending on the glaze. 
Make sure your glazes are mixed really well before dipping and your kiln shelves are well protected in case your glaze runs. So this is a photograph of the same glaze. This is sapphire blue um, that we use at Cedar Hill Rec Center where I work. Um, and so this is just at different thicknesses. So you can see when it's really thin, it's not even blue. Um, and then when in the middle, you get like a bit of this dark green um, and a bit of blue. And then where it's thicker, you get more of that blue color. Um, just looking at the comments, uh, Claire says, in consideration of the possible ban on single use plastics, I have found that the little jam jars work really well for test glazes. You can even get solid plastic lids that will last for a long time. Ooh, that's a really good idea. Um, do you mean mason jars? Um, I have mason jars with plastic lids that are great, but I have not used them for glaze testing. So that's um, a consideration as well as um, getting glass uh, test cups that you can wash and reuse. So thank you for that. Um, Frida says, are you dipping test cups or can you brush? So um, because I dip my glazes generally, um, then I would dip my test tiles. But if you are brushing with your are brushing your glazes on your pots, then I would also brush your test tiles because you want your test tile to be a representation of the final result. Um, so if you are brushing your pots, then definitely I would opt to be brushing the glaze on my test tiles. Um, number six. When dipping test tiles, make it a habit to always submerge the tile for the same amount of time. For example, I always do a six second dip for test tiles. If I do more or less, I'll write it on the test tile for reference. This helps for consistency of results. The reason I do six seconds, which I consider long for dipping regular pots, so I don't recommend that you dip your regular mugs and bowls for six seconds. Um, but I dip my test tiles for six seconds because a small test tile generally won't absorb as much glaze as a large piece would. So I want the test tile to be somewhat of an accurate representation of how the glaze would look on a piece. Number seven, take a glaze recipe that you like, remove the colorant and then taste, uh, and then test the base recipe on its own. This will help you really see the glaze at its core without being aesthetically influenced by its color. Is it glossy or matte? Is it rough or smooth? Is it opaque or transparent? Does it have flex and variation or is it uniform? Does it craze or not? Does it run or is it stable? Then you can compare the base to how it looks with colorants and see how the colorant has affected the melt and the surface texture. Colorants can change more than just the color. If you're not sure which are the colorants, they're typically copper, cobalt, iron, chrome, manganese, nickel, rutile, titanium, zircopax, tin, and mason stains. So generally, those are the main colorants um, that you're gonna find in a glaze recipe. So if you just take your recipe, um, remove any of the colorants or opacifiers, like um, zircopax is an opacifier, makes white, so white's kind of a color, um, and uh, remove the colorants and then just test the base recipe on its own. So yeah, so this picture is this black glaze here, um, and then this is it without the colorants. Um, so you can see it's still matte. It's a matte white, matte black, um, and this is the base recipe. So some base recipes are gonna be clear, some of them are gonna be white, some of them are gonna be kind of um, uh, vaguely transparent or translucent. Um, so you'll know that when you take the colorants out and just test the base on its own. Um, Elena says, for writing on tests, what to use? Um, so I use, um, I use an underglaze pencil. Um, like it's a, like a pencil crayon, but it's made from underglaze. So it will withstand the firing. Um, before I discovered the underglaze pencils, I used um, just 
liquid underglaze in a little squeeze bottle with a fine tip. So I would squeeze and write that way, which um, is a skill to develop if you have a lot of things to write on your test tile. Um, so the pencil makes it really easy to write a lot of information on the test tile. Um, and before that, I used like red iron oxide mixed with water and a paintbrush. So there's lots of different ways that you can um, mark your test tiles, but I definitely recommend the underglaze pencil. They're kind of expensive, like um, they're around $20 here, but um, it should last you a long time if you don't don't drop it and break the lead <laughs> or the, the whatever it's called now. Um, yeah, so um, well worth it. Uh, Lynn says, do you have a preferred place in the kiln for firing test tiles? Do you avoid the top and bottom shelves? Um, it depends. Um, if I am testing a batch of test tiles, like a whole bunch of test tiles, I will um, put all the test tiles together and then I'll put a cone pack next to the test tiles so I can make sure that I know what temperature those test tiles made it to. Um, but if you're just trying to um, use test tiles to fill the kiln, sometimes I'll just kind of fit them where wherever they'll fit in between my pots just to use up that space. So um, I'm not too picky if it just means getting a test or two into the kiln to see what happens. And then sometimes if I, um, you know, put a bunch of random tests in and then when I get those results out, I might want to do some further testing, in which case um, I would make sure that all the tests are in one spot with the cone pack next to them. And then I can make sure that I know um, what temperature that they were fired to. Um, okay, so number eight is test the base recipe from tip number seven with different colorants. So examples of colorants you could try are one to 4% copper carbonate. So you could either just um, like test with 1% copper, 1% um, iron, 1% cobalt, um, or you could do um, a test with 1% copper and then 2% copper and 3% copper. And then that's going to give you kind of a range of um, like the saturation of color. Um, and then you can kind of see what you like best. So um, just depending how much time you want to spend testing, um, the options are limitless. Um, but yeah, one to 4% copper carbonate um, is like well within like the normal range. Uh, one to 10% red iron oxide, 0.5 to 2% cobalt. Um, so cobalt is a really powerful colorant. So generally a very small percentage of cobalt um, is going to give you um, a lot of color. So 0.5% can often give you as much blue as you need. And then like 2% would be a lot of cobalt, generally. 5 to 10% mason stain. Um, and then 5 to 10% zircopax. And zircopax is an opacifier that will whiten your, your glaze. So it'll, um, zircopax will turn a transparent glaze and make it opaque. Um, so if you have a clear glaze, like a clear glossy glaze, then Zircopax would make it a white glossy glaze. And uh, if you have like a translucent matte glaze, then Zircopax would make it like a white matte glaze. Uh, there are more colorants, but these are the most common for when you're just getting started. Um, so this picture is one base glaze with different colorants. So I think this is manganese and then, or no, that's chrome. Uh, these four are red iron oxide. These two are copper. This one is cobalt. The, and then these two are probably manganese over here. So it's a lovely rainbow of test tiles. Uh, tip number nine, when you make a test glaze batch, make at least 200 grams. Um, now people might argue with me on this one, but this is what I do. Uh, you can go smaller, but smaller batches will be less accurate unless you have a scale that measures less than one gram increments of readability. So scales, um, 
you can buy different types of scales that um, for different purposes. So some scales will have a large capacity, meaning they can weigh um, a large amount, uh, like a higher weight of glaze or of whatever you're weighing. Um, and then you can get scales that have a, a lower capacity, but the readability is more accurate. So the readability is, um, the, is the increments that the scale measures in. So some scales measure in one gram increments, um, or you can get scales that measure in 0.1 gram increments or even 0.01 gram increments. So if your scale doesn't weigh to less than one gram, so a decimal point, um, then when you mix a 100 gram batch, the, the margin of error due to the accuracy of the scale um, can really throw off the glaze recipe. So if you're off by a very small amount, like say you're off by one gram, um, once that gets multiplied into a larger batch, like if you make a 10,000 gram batch, um, then your, your small error uh, is magnified. Um, and so I like to make 200 gram glaze batches because it just cuts that margin of error in half of, of what you would get from a 100 gram batch. And then it just helps that my glaze tests to be more accurate representations of what they would be when I'm weighing a larger batch of glaze. Um, so if the smallest measurement your scale will weigh is one gram, then you'll get more accurate results with 200 gram batches than with 100 gram batches. Uh, making 200 grams also gives you enough glaze to submerge your test tiles without hitting the bottom of the cup. Uh, that's just a little thing that I noticed. So these are the some different scales. Um, so this is the scale we have at the studio where I work. Um, it's an OHAS Scout Pro. Um, uh, really great scale. Uh, I've been using it for the last six years and um, yeah, it's great. Plugs into the wall. Uh, and then this is my triple beam balance scale that I have at home. So this scale will allow me to measure in tenth of a gram increments, this triple beam scale. So I use this scale uh, when I'm measuring colorants and um, and very small when I'm doing glaze tests. So if I'm doing a glaze test, anything less than 500 grams, I'll usually use this scale. And then this is a um, OHA scale as well, CS series. This is the digital scale that I have at home. Um, so this goes up to 5,000 grams um, in one gram increments. So I wouldn't use this scale for measuring small um, amounts for glaze testing. I would use this one. Um, and you can also get digital scales that have a readability of less than one gram that would be more accurate for glaze testing. So just something to keep in mind, people are always um, asking about why their large batch doesn't match their small test batch. And often it's just because of that margin of error with making a very small batch of glaze. Um, and then it, and then when you make the large batch of glaze, it's more accurate because um, the amounts that you're weighing are much larger. So if you're off by a gram or two in 10,000 grams, um, it's not gonna be noticeable. Whereas if you're off by even one gram in a 100 gram batch, then that's gonna have a significant effect on the result. Um, Jill says, I don't see your pointer. Does anyone else see it? Do you mean like my mouse pointer arrow? I don't know. Oh, I see that it's not showing. So sorry if I'm pointing at things and you can't see them. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I'll try to be more description descriptive with my words. Um, Okay, number 10. If you want to test a few different colorants in one base, make a large batch of the base and then divide it into smaller test cups before adding colorants. For example, if you wanna test five different colorants, you can make a thousand gram batch of the base recipe, mix and sieve the glaze, and then divide it equally by volume into five different test cups. 
Uh, you have to make sure it's mixed really well before you um, divide it into the five cups. This will give you approximately 200 grams of the base materials in each test cup. Then you can add the colorants as percentages of 200 grams. So I made, um, so for this, I think I made 1200 grams because there's six cups here. I made 1200 grams of a base recipe, uh, mixed it, sieved it, mixed it uh, really well, and then just divided it equally between the six cups. So there's, oh, pardon me, I'm not reading. So these all have 150 grams in each cup, approximately, because you're not gonna get super accurate just by dividing volume, uh, but close enough to kind of um, see if you wanna take a glaze further. Um, and then I added colorants into each cup as percentages of 150 grams. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just whatever the base is divided, like the large batch divided by the number of cups, that's how many grams of dry material you're going to have in each cup plus water. Um, and then you can weigh out your colorants as a percentage of uh, the dry materials that in, is in each cup. So if I wanted 1% copper in a 150 gram batch, then I would add 1.5 grams of copper, for example. Uh, number 11, after you've tested different colorants in a base recipe, try blending them together. This will give you new colors. For example, you could take a test containing 2% copper and mix it with a test containing 1% cobalt. As long as the batch sizes are equal, um, so it's like a 50-50 uh, blend, the resulting glaze will have 1% copper and 0.5% cobalt. So you can find some glaze gems in this way. Number 12, put a glaze test in every firing. So just reiterating what I said earlier, this is the number one habit that will lead to a deeper understanding of your glazes. Because seeing those results come out of the kiln, you can read blogs and watch YouTube videos and learn and learn and learn and learn. But until you, until you start uh, doing your own testing and then putting those tests in the kiln and seeing the results come out, um, that's when the information really starts to stick. And then you can make decisions, you can make changes, um, and you can just start down the glaze testing rabbit hole, uh, trying lots of new things and um, creating uh, making your own glaze creations. Number 13, don't forget to use witness cones in all your glaze firings. You'd be surprised at what a difference a higher or lower temperature firing will make on your glaze results. <clears throat> so this is an example of a cone pack, uh, which I put at least one in every firing. Every now and then I'll put uh, one on each shelf just to make sure my kilns is firing accurately. Or if I have um, a glaze that I really want, need to know exactly um, what temperature it was fired to, then I'll put a cone pack next to that glaze or a group of test tiles. Um, but definitely don't skip, if you're gonna get into the habit of glaze testing, don't skip the cone pack because as soon as anything goes wrong and you're troubleshooting, um, you need to know what the cones look like. Um, and you always need them after you forgot them. So just make it a habit to put them in every firing and then you'll never um, be without that information. Uh, so this cone pack has a cone four, six, and seven. Uh, normally I would use cone five, six, and seven for cone six firing, uh, but I ran out of five, so I use four. And so the, the cone below the target cone is just a guide to tell you, okay, time to get ready, the kiln's gonna shut off soon. So in this case, um, it tells me when we've reached cone four, and then I know that cone six is coming. Um, Lynn asks, how long do you stir your test glazes? Um, so I have um, a cordless drill with a teeny tiny mixing attachment. It's like a little paint mixing attachment. Um, and, or I also have a, like a hand blender or an immersion blender. So I always make sure to high speed mix my glaze tests. Um, and then 
So I'll always do that in the beginning. And then when I'm actually about to dip a test tile, um, then I'll use the spatula and I'll just make sure that it's just mixed really well. So going back and forth um, and, you know, for like, if it's like a little cup of a glaze test, like stirring it for five seconds or so should be enough. But I always make sure that, um, that I'm high speed mixing at some point, especially if the glaze has been sitting um, or if I'm mixing a new batch of glaze. Um, high speed mixing is important just to get uh, the, the, the materials homogenized with each other. And then the more you mix and then you're getting the materials homogenized with the water. So you're making sure that the water hasn't risen to the top, that the water is um, completely homogenized with those uh, glaze particles. Um, okay, number 14, take lots of notes and photos of your process and results. So keep a glaze testing journal and write everything down. You never know when the smallest detail can make a big difference. When you keep track of it all, you will start to connect the dots on which factors are in influencing your results. Um, so if you're not currently keeping a glaze journal, um, I recommend that you start um, because glaze testing is kind of like a science experiment. And so you need to keep track of all the steps because then you can go back and repeat. If you get a result that you like, you can repeat those steps. Um, so you wanna know like how long you dipped your test tile for, um, the specific gravity of the glaze. So like the ratio of solid particles to water so that you can, when you get a result that you like out of the kiln, you can go back and repeat the steps that it took to get that result. And then you can get that result again. Um, so I have a blog post called what to keep track of in your glaze journal. Um, so if you want to Google that, there is a list of all the things that I like to write down um, at different stages of the making, the glaze mixing, the glazing and the firing process and the kiln unloading process. It's important to um, when you unload the kiln, take notes then as well as to what your results look like. Um, and then go back and compare your results to the process that got you those results. And that helps you make the connection between, okay, I did these things and this is what happened. And then you can make changes or try to repeat it for next time. Um, Sarah says, how long do you leave the newly mixed glaze from dry uh, before you use it? Do you leave it for 24 hours or can you use it straight away? Um, I do both. Sometimes I just get inspiration uh, where I want to mix up a glaze um, or I have some kiln space and I want to mix up a glaze and get those tests into the kiln. Um, so I don't always wait. Sometimes I'll mix up a glaze um, and let it sit and then I'll do the mixing and sieving the next day or later. Um, if you, the longer you wait, it gives, um, if there are any soluble materials in the glaze recipe that are gonna affect the viscosity of the glaze, um, it gives them time to, um, to do their dissolving and, and have that effect on the glaze if they're going to. Um, so I do recommend waiting, but um, I don't always wait. So um, I just, but I will make a note in my glaze journal um, if I waited or if I tested right away, just so I know um, what led to the results because it could be that um, I mix up a test batch quickly, um, dip a test towel right away, and then the next time I dip a test towel in the same batch, um, the results may be different. The glaze may have thickened over time. Um, so just making sure that you're keeping track of everything so that you know uh, what variables are affecting your results. Um, Onita asks, do you check the specific gravity of your test glazes? Um, yeah, I do. So um, in the example where I made a large batch of glaze and then I divided it into smaller cups, what I would do is I would measure the specific gravity of that large batch because um, that is 
that'll get the water to solid ratio that I want. Um, and then I'll divide it into the smaller batches and then I won't necessarily um, test those smaller batches um, just because, um, um, yeah, it's just extra work and extra time. So you wanna test specific gravity kind of as much as it makes sense to do so. Um, but you don't want to like get caught in the minutia uh, where you're like so annoyed with all the steps that it's going to take um, and then you're not going to do the testing. So um, but in order to like if you if you're testing a glaze, you want to measure the specific gravity of that glaze test um, before uh, of the small batch so that you can match it if you're going to make a larger batch. So it really depends like on what stage of testing I'm in. But if I'm like, okay, this is a glaze that I want to try and use, um, then I am going to measure specific gravity because if I want to duplicate that glaze in the future, then I want to make sure that the specific gravity of the larger batch, it matches the specific gravity of the small test. Um, Scott says I'm frozen, um, so I don't see me frozen, but um, someone else let me know if I'm also frozen for them. Um, yeah, so hopefully, Scott, uh, that I come back to life <laughs> soon. Um, number 15, have fun, experiment, be creative, try new things, follow your curiosity, and enjoy the process. Glaze testing makes unloading the kiln even more exciting. There's something about coming up with a test you want to try, making it, and then seeing the results that feels so empowering. If you see it, glaze testing as a chore, you're probably not going to do it very much. But if you see it as an exciting way to add a new level of creativity to the ceramics process, you'll probably make some interesting discoveries. Here's me and my respirator. Um, okay, everyone's saying I'm good. Um, safety first. So definitely always, 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 if you're mixing dry glaze materials, um, wear your respirator. Um, yeah, because the if we breathe in um, the glaze materials, they can be very damaging to our lungs. Um, so always make sure that you're protecting your lungs. I hope this post gave you some ideas for tests you can try. This is a very broad overview of ways to test glazes. If you have any questions or want me to go deeper on one of the tips, let me know in the comments. No knowledge of chemistry is required to do this type of glaze testing. Once you're hooked on glaze testing, there's a whole wide world of chemistry to explore. The depth of knowledge you can reach is endless. So I hope you'll join me on the glaze journey. Awesome. So that is the end of the blog post. Just go back to the comments. Uh, Lynn says, how often do you change your P100 cartridges? Um, so where I work, um, I work for a municipality. Um, so we are very regulated with our rules. And um, so when we open a new pack of cartridges, um, we are to write the expiry date six months out. Um, so you can see on this photograph, uh, I've written the expiry date on the cartridges. Um, so that lets me know when to change them. But I did ask the occupational health and safety guy whether six months um, is like standard across the board. And he said that if you're using your respirator daily, um, or weekly, then six months is about the standard. But he said, if you're using it very infrequently, then um, then they can last a bit longer. I probably would change them out every year. Like if I'm only using it once a month or so, uh, then maybe every year getting a new set of cartridges would be good. And um, always keep your cartridges in a sealed plastic bag because um, they'll continue to breathe the air in the atmosphere if they're exposed, um, if they're just left out in the open. So uh, we just put our respirator in a Ziploc bag and seal that up so that um, the dust in the atmosphere can't um, be getting into those cartridges. 
Uh, Jody, I think I just answered your questions or your question. Yes, I store it in a bag when not in use. Um, okay, so that is it. Um, if I didn't see your question, because I am not, Facebook won't let me scroll down so I can only see the last four questions, um, then please ask it again. And I hope, um, I hope this post has given you some ideas for um, if you haven't started glaze testing um, that you might want to start. Um, even if you're using commercial glazes, there are lots of tests that you can do with commercial glazes. Um, you can test them at different thicknesses. You can like test brushing them versus dipping them. Um, you can try layering them over and under. You can try like, um, um, like adding like different specific gravities, adding water to them because you can measure specific gravity of a glaze you mixed yourself or a commercial glaze, it doesn't matter. Um, so if you want information about glaze journaling, I have an article on that on my um, website and um, like cone packs we talked about, lots of different things that we talked about. Um, I have other articles um, a kiln wash recipe to protect your kiln shelves. So if you're going to get into glaze testing, there's a good chance that you may have some runny glazes at some point in time. So you want to make sure that your kiln shelves are protected with kiln wash. Um, it's also a good idea um, to make little clay discs or cookies as we call them um, that you can put your tests on. So if the glaze runs, it's just going to stick to the little clay cookie and not your actual kiln shelf. Um, and I do paint kiln wash on the clay cookies as well, because then um, it just helps to release so that the clay doesn't fuse um, to the test tile. It just helps everything become unstuck. And you can either throw the cookies out or re-kiln wash them um, and reuse them. Uh, Randall says, absolutely, I would absolutely test a commercial glaze before putting it on a beloved piece and hoping for the best. Yeah, I mean, just the just the fact of when you get a new commercial glaze, um, just dipping a test tile to see how it looks before you start glazing your pots with it um, is a very, a very good tip. Uh, not to mention like trying to experiment with it, um, but just testing it to see how it looks in your kiln at the temperature that you're firing to, uh, because there are so many variables that can affect how um, a glaze is going to look after the firing. So that is a really great tip. Okay, so that is it for story time for today. Uh, next story time will be on Thursday morning. And so if you're on my email list, you'll be getting an email about it on Tuesday. Um, thank you for joining me on this Sunday. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I will see you next time. Okay, bye.